morning, would you turn to Malachi? Thank you so much, Rose. And I remember that song from my teenage years, too. I love that song. Beautiful. Malachi chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. We finished up the first three chapters of John, and we're moving now into a series of messages in Malachi. You know, it was a number of years ago back, I guess it was around 1988, 1989, I was a student at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and uh, I had the blessing of being introduced to Ben Lehman, many of you have met, and then as a result of that, uh, was engaged in evangelism training. And I went through something that's called continuing witness training, and it required uh, the memory of sharing the gospel in a four-part uh, form. It required memorizing somewhere between 21 and 23 verses. And still to this day, I remember that outline, remember the verses. But as we went into the study, it's very interesting that when we began the presentation, the first of the four parts in truth was this, God loves you. And we began by sharing about God's love. We moved into that to the fact that we as sinners uh, have uh, uh, offended God through our sin, have transgressed, have broken his commands, his law, our hearts have gone astray. And then after that, we would share about Christ being God's provision for us and the importance of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. But it's very interesting as we were sharing this, that it all began with God's love. God loves you today. No matter what your experiences have been, no matter where you are right now, God loves you. One of the 52 parables that Jesus communicated in the gospel is the parable of the prodigal son. And you may remember that. A son takes an early inheritance. He asks his father for it. He goes into a foreign land, begins to spend that money frivolously and immorally, uh, finds himself basically bankrupt, is feeding the pigs, longing to eat what the pigs were eating, and the thought occurs to him, maybe I can go back to my father and he would take me back as one of his servants, not as a son. That would be even better than where I am now. And you may remember that parable. He goes back, the father meets him and throws a beautiful robe on him, has a great feast and restores him, not as a servant, but as a son. And that's a picture of God's love for us, that God loves us. In fact, I don't know anything else about your life today, but I know this, God loves you. And so we're going to see God's love for his people in Malachi uh, this morning. Look with me at Malachi chapter 1. I want to begin reading in verse 1. An oracle, or that is a burden, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? This is the Lord's declaration. Even so, I've loved Jacob, but I've hated Esau. I turned Esau's mountains into a wasteland and gave his inheritance to the desert jackals. Though Edom says we have been devastated, but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of hosts says this, they may build, but I will demolish they will be called a wicked country and a people the Lord has cursed forever. Your own eyes will see this and you yourselves will say, the Lord is great even beyond the borders of Israel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your sovereign love. We thank you, Lord, for your election love. We thank you, God, that uh, it is by your grace that we or in right standing with you. And Lord, your grace to any of us is merely an act of your love toward us. Father, as we come to this study today, what an appropriate place to begin. Your love for the nation of Israel. But as we study it, I pray you would help us to see how it applies to ourselves today. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, today, again, we begin this new study uh, here in Malachi. Malachi is both the last book in order 
in the Old Testament and also the last book chronologically. It was written somewhere around the mid 400s BC. This morning we studied Esther and we studied Mordecai in that time period when Israel was under uh, the Medo-Persian rule. Uh, this text today is uh, just shortly preceding or rather after uh, that time. Uh, and uh, as we look at it today, uh, he was sort of a, a contemporary uh, to Ezra and Nehemiah, and his name means my messenger. Some believe this to be a general name. Others believe it speaks to a specific person. I, I tend to lean toward the latter. But the recipients of this prophecy were the people of Israel. And there are a couple of unique facts about this book. Malachi, in this book, there are four chapters. There are 27 questions that are asked. It amazed me. That many in such a small, most of those questions were rhetorical in nature. In other words, they were asked to make someone think. It is the last prophetic word of God for some 400 and some years as recorded. Because you have the intertestamental period, and then uh, in our last study, in the beginning of John, we looked at John the Baptist ministry, and John was that last prophet to come before the Lord to point, point people toward the Messiah. But you know, as we begin this study, we're going to look today at the love of God. And as we think about God's dominant characteristics, really two come to my mind, holiness and love. And the two come together. God is holy, and so he's separate from us. He, he is holy. He is separate from sin. We're sinful beings. But he is also in the spirit of the father of the prodigal, loving toward us. And so as we look at it, um, we're going to look really at three things today. Next week, we're going to move and look at the people's response to God's love. And it's not too attractive. We'll get there next week, but it begins first with God's love. And I want you to see with me first in verse 1, the burden of the prophet. It says there, an oracle, the word of the Lord. Now, an oracle really was a burden. It was a heavy message that this prophet had. And as he was going to speak to the people of Israel, all of us like to give good news and he begins by sharing the good news. But as we go through the book, we're going to see that in regard to God, there was good news. God loved them. But in regard to the people of Israel, they were not bringing a great return in the love of God. And so the recipients of this message were preparing to hear from Malachi, maybe thinking it would be something favorable. But Malachi realizing it was going to be a heavy marriage, uh, message, rather. You know, I have a good friend who uh, has a son who recently completed the State Police Academy. And it's a rigorous academy. And uh, I've sort of followed this young man. And uh, he's an outstanding young man. He's working in the Chesterfield area now. And I realize there are a lot of things that our state troopers go through that we don't appreciate. In fact, I think this young man had gone in maybe a 90 plus mile an hour chase with a convicted felon, had to stop him. Uh, and the, the person who was riding with him began to uh, flee the scene also. He tracked one of them down, facing the threat of himself being shot, and he had to make a quick decision and made a wise decision not to shoot. And many times we look at them and we criticize them, but boy, it's a tough job. And, and as we begin to talk, I realize in my prayer for him is, God, if you've called him to do this, just give him the strength really to, to stand in what is a difficult uh, position. You know, I've never been a state policeman, and, uh, but I have thought about the work that they do. One of the most difficult tasks, I believe, that confronts an officer is this, when he has to knock on the door of some unsuspecting parents or loved ones when someone has died in a vehicle accident and having to be the first one to present the news that your son, your daughter, your loved one is no longer here. It's a burden. 
and I, I don't, I hope they don't have to do that very often, but I'm sure if uh, they stay in that line of work, there are those times they have to make that knock, they have to carry out that message, and it's not an easy one. Here, Malachi is carrying out a part of his work as a prophet that was not easy. It's not easy to to share uh, not so good news with people. And so as he begins to knock on the door of the people of Israel, he, he says, listen, this is a burden, but I'm gonna share it with you. And he begins to share the attributes that we're gonna see over the next few weeks. You're a disobedient people. You're ungrateful. You mistreat others. You're taking and stealing from God. You're unfaithful in the things that God has given you. You're a greedy people. And I don't know about you, but even a little honey can make, cannot make any of that taste any better. And so he shares this message. But beneath all of the message in this burden is that quiet confidence that God is loving that he loved Israel, that he chose Israel for his uh, purpose. You know, sometimes the truth can be painful. We're living in a day today where people don't want to hear the truth. They want to hear everything is okay. We sort of avert the bad news. Uh, we avert uh, being corrected in any way. But Malachi was a voice when a voice was needed. And so he shared this oracle. But I want you to see a second aspect of this, and we see it in verses two through four. God's great love for Israel. You know, we're an imperfect people, aren't we? We mess up all the time. I was laughing. Uh, I was uh, talking with the group in the back there. I dropped my phone. It's a dumb phone, so you don't have to worry about it. I don't have to have a case uh, on that. I think Noah said, uh, you, you're going to break your phone. I'm not too worried about it. Uh, it looks pretty bad anyway. But we make mistakes all the time. The funny thing for me is I, I drop the remote control every day at the house. I just fumble it every day. It's, it's a, you'll hear it hit the wood floor. The batteries will go out. I'll put the batteries back in. I just have the fumbles all the time. And I was thinking, what about the mistakes that we make? Do you realize that the average person in his or her lifetime will incur 9,672 minor injuries? Over nine, almost 10,000 minor injuries in the average lifetime someone will experience. And probably most of those are self-caused. We stub our foot uh, going through a dark room or we hit our head on something. But what about morally? How imperfect are we intentionally, morally? I, I looked at that this week. The average person lies four times per day, just tells an untruth four times per day. The average person age 50 then has told an untruth over 73,000 times. Most of us are unlovely. Hey, as we go through this study, Israel was unlovely, disobedient not giving God its best, actually stealing from God, unfaithful in marriage, all of these things. Yet God had great plans for Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 10, they're described, Israel is described as the apple of his eye. Do you realize today that God also loves you? I don't know, nor am I concerned with what has brought you to this point. What I'm looking at is to you right now saying that God loves you and God has a plan for your life. The same God uh, who is described and compared to, to that father in the parable, the prodigal son, loves us when we turn to him. And so he's speaking to a nation here in verse 2. And he says, I have loved you. And the idea as he's speaking to the nation of Israel in verse 2 is this, I have loved you and I continue to love you. The part of speech there, that verb carries the idea of the past love moving right up to the present time. And so uh, we see that, that he loved Jacob. Jacob is Israel. In fact, as we look at Jacob here, it really can refer to, to a couple of things here. Jacob, God gave him the name in Genesis 32, Israel. 
All right. And so Israel was a person, but also in our context here, it is the lineage of that person. It's the people who followed uh, Jacob or Israel. The same is true with Esau. Esau was a person, yet Edom, they were the people that came from Esau. And so we see that God gives this comparison here. So he's telling them here, I have loved you. Israel, I've loved you as a people. And immediately they say, how have you loved us? You know, it's amazing their ingratitude here. We'll look in a few moments at what God had already to this point in history done for Israel. And Israel is still questioning the love. How have you loved us? Do you realize that one of the worst sins a person can commit is a lack of gratitude? In fact, a lack of gratitude will lead to discontentment. It will lead to you and me doing things we would never do. In fact, it is really a root for many other sins. And the people of Israel here were guilty of a lot of wrongdoing. Yet we see underneath all of that was this lack of gratitude. They had lost an appreciation for the love of God. And we can do the same. We can get caught up in our lives. We can get caught up doing what we're doing. We can have maybe hardship or a temporary hardship and immediately we're ready to blame God. How have you loved us? Well, how did God love Israel? We could be talking all day and we could talk even longer about how he loves us. But let me give you two illustrations, uh, metaphors really of the love of God. The first one is in Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 4. The 8th century prophet Isaiah was prophesying to the people and he used the metaphor of a vineyard. And basically he's saying to Israel, you are God's vineyard. You're, you're the vineyard. And so how does he describe the vineyard? It's pictured as that in which God first came and broke up the ground. He cleared it of stones and he planted the most choice of vines. That vineyard, great effort, great care, great attention was given to it. Yet when uh, the vineyard owner and worker looked for fruit from it, there was no fruit. Then there's another illustration uh, another prophet, Ezekiel, in chapter 16, uh, verses 1 and following, he describes Israel as an untended child. That child is left out in the open, thrashing with no one to care. And so one comes, cleans her up, cares for her, raises her, protects her. However, in turn, that one who had received so much care when she came of age, began to chase after others. That's a picture of Israel. That foundation, God loved. God tended like a vineyard. God raised and protected that child who had no home. That, that's, that's the base. But then the response was love that was spurned. You see, God chose Israel with no merit on her own. She had no merit. Jacob himself was not by nature a righteous person. In fact, the Bible tells us that Jacob was a deceiver. In fact, he deceived his father. Remember, his father could not see well, and he received the blessing from his father by deceit. He conspired with his mother in order to get the upper hand on Esau. And so as we look at Jacob, there was nothing in his life that would merit God's love or favor. In fact, we can go beyond Jacob even to Abraham. Abraham came from a pagan family. Terah believed in false gods, yet God called Abram out of that. So we see that God's election here was not based on what man had done, but on God's loving choice. And he chose Israel over Esau. So as we look at Jacob and Esau, Esau was the elder brother and, and should have had all of that which entitled being the older brother, but he didn't. And God orchestrated that where Jacob was the one who received favor. And so he, they say, well, how have you loved us? He said, wasn't well, Esau Jacob's brother? And then he goes on at the end of verse 2 and beginning of verse 3, I have loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. Now, again, that doesn't mean literal hatred in the way, but what it meant is I chose 
you, Jacob, over Esau. Remember, Jesus said, unless someone hates his father and mother, even his own life, he can't be my disciple. That speaks to, as compared to the love that we have for God, any other thing should be hatred. It speaks to election, to choice, that we choose God. And so basically what we see here is God is saying, I have chosen you, Israel. You say, how have I loved you, but I have given you my favor over Edom. Now from Israel would come the Messiah. But we see in verses 3 and 4 what would come from Edom. From Edom, it would be merely a wasteland. That its inheritance would be given over to desert jackals. In other words, uh, Esau or, or Edom, the territory just sort of south and east of the promised land, would be uh, an area that would be vacated. It would be like a ghost town. In verse 4, though Edom says, we have been devastated, we will rebuild. But notice what it says uh, though they may build, I will demolish. That's what God says in verse 4. And he says its people will be cursed forever. So Israel is saying, how have you loved us? And God is saying, look at, at my plans for you. I have plans for you. I've loved you. I've loved you in the past. I'm loving you up till now. And I have a future plan for Israel. Notice what he says in verse 5. Your own eyes will see this. That is... What will they see? They will see the demise of Edom and they will realize they're still standing. So here is Israel saying, how have you loved us? And God says, look at what's going to happen to Edom. They're going to be destroyed. They're going to be demolished. They're going to try to rebuild. I'm going to be against them. They'll be cursed forever. And guess what, Israel? You're going to stand through that and you're going to see it. And these words should have resonated with Israel that God loved them because about some 150 years earlier, the prophet Jeremiah in 29, 11 said this, for I know the plans I have for you, Israel, plans to prosper you and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And so let me add it to you this way. Israel saying, have you loved me? God said, I've loved you, and you will see. And let's just put it this way. I don't know any Edomites on the earth today. They're none. But there are a lot of Israelites. God had a plan for Israel. But I want you to see that Israel had a limited view of God. Not only did this nation in this context 400 some years before Jesus come misunderstand the love of God, they misunderstood the plan of God. That God had a plan through them that was far greater than they. Look at verse 5. It says, your own eyes will see this and you yourselves will say, the Lord is great even beyond the borders of Israel. One translation said, out from Israel's borders, all this would happen. In other words, God who so loved Israel was working in the lives of the people of Israel to bring glory to himself. And part of that, as we see in Isaiah 60, was that Israel would be a light to the nations. But Israel was ethnocentric. That is, all they were thinking was about themselves, about their daily affairs. They couldn't grasp that God had used Babylon prior to this time for his purposes to discipline them. They could not see uh, that God would work through a king, Cyrus of Persia, who would allow the people to come back into the land, or that Darius would allow uh, the, the, the people to rebuild the temple. They couldn't see that Edom would be judged. All of this Israel missed. And they most certainly had forgotten that God had the plan, at least in this context. They were so caught up in their daily affairs that they forgot the great promise. They underappreciated the great promise that the Messiah would come. Let's just think about God's love for Israel for a moment. He established her as a people in Abraham's call. He brought Israel out of slavery through the instrumentation of Moses. 
He sent her into captivity as a form of discipline because they did not obey the commands. They did not observe the Sabbath years, one in every seven years for those 490, 70 years. Specifically, they went into captivity. They didn't realize God's sovereign and loving hand in that. And they certainly didn't realize that some 100 years plus prior to them being allowed to come back into the land, God prophesied that Cyrus would be his enemy instrument to allow the people to come back into the promised land. Two righteous men, Abraham and Moses, two unrighteous men, Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus. Yet God working in Israel, through Israel, and beyond Israel to show his love for them. You say this morning, this is some 2,400 years ago. It's really spoken to Israel. How does this apply to me in 2023? Well, first, I think it's important that we remember God keeps his promises. He had a covenant with Israel. I don't believe he is finished with his work in this nation even today. But second, through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, you too can become a chosen person if you would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't understand all about election. I wish I did. I've studied it. I believe it because the Bible teaches it. I believe, and we see in the text today, God chose one in the womb, and he didn't choose the other. I, I tend to believe what the Bible teaches. I may not be able to explain it all, but I do know the fact of the matter is today, wherever you are, Jesus Christ is Savior, and God's calling you to believe on him. I'm the messenger today. God is the one who does the saving. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Have you trusted Christ? It may be God's sovereign plan for your life right now, that you're in this building right now to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ that you might believe and become a child of the promise. Now, I wouldn't promise you, would you accept Christ, that you'll go from this place and not have difficulty in your life. Some of the greatest Christians I know have gone through the greatest difficulties, but I can promise you on the authority of God's word, you're going to be okay. He's going to walk with you, as the song said. We're, he's going to be with us, and we come out in the end. I wonder today, do you understand the vast love God has for you? My maternal grandfather passed away almost 50 years ago, I guess it's uh, been. And uh, I loved my papa, that's what I called him. It was my mom's dad that I was most close to. Um, he's the one I shared a number of years ago. The first vehicle I bought, I bought with my grandfather when I was six years old. We bought a Ford pickup. I paid $3.47 and he gave cash for the other 2,900 and some dollars. And we called it our truck and we kept it in our house for a number of years. I love my papa, I knew he loved me. Uh, his sister owned a country store in Evergreen, J.K. Hamilton, she and her husband owned that store for a number of years and we used to have party all the time. I've shared it, if you've been here, I would get my snack and my papa would get either Vienna sausages and buttermilk or sardines and buttermilk and that's the truth. I don't know how he ate both of them. We would do that, we called it party, that was our late snack. I didn't want to disappoint my papa. I knew he'd love me. But I realized one day how much he loved me. When I was young, um, I used to love to pitch against. We didn't have backstops then. I would just go out and throw a rubber ball or a baseball, whatever I could find, against a wall and try to catch it. And I, my mom probably thought I was obsessive. I would do it for a half hour, hour at a time. I would just throw and catch and throw, and I guess it kept me entertained. One day I was at my papa's house. He was, he was a building contractor. He was out working, and I let go at the wrong point, and it went right through a window pane, and it broke. 
And my nanny, who was a wonderful lady, she told me the worst thing she could. She says, we'll just wait until Papa gets home and figure out what to do with this. So I was waiting for three hours. It was like the time wasn't moving. I just wanted to get it behind me. And Papa came home, looked at the mirror, gave me a hug, said it's all good. And he went and paid for the pain himself. I didn't even have to pay for it. Now, my grandfather would discipline me, and I'm not saying that he didn't discipline me, and he loved me when he disciplined me, but I've never forgotten that. That's been over 50 years ago. And so if you said that Randall Wooldridge loved you, I said, I know he did. I know he did. Because I could mess up, and he still loved me. That's our loving God. No matter what you've gone through in your life, today. God loves you. Wouldn't you trust in him? Wouldn't you believe in him? If you have never trusted him, I want you to know that, that God loves you so much that he didn't just pay a few dollars to repair a broken pain. He paid with the life of his son that you might live forever. Wouldn't you believe in him today? How could you forsake? How could you reject such a great love as his? Maybe today, you're a recipient of that love. You say, yes, pastor, I believed in him. I know I believe in him. I trust. I know he died for me. I've turned from my sin. We're going to be looking at the nation of Israel, and there's a reason that the second word here is oracle. There's a reason the prophet had a burden because as we move in these next few weeks, we're going to see that God's love for this nation didn't bring a great return. The good news for you and me today is when we appreciate the love of God, begin to grasp the love of God, then the next step is we begin to live in his power, in his freedom, in that love and confidence. And we're able to be the instrument that God uses beyond the borders of any nation to draw people to him. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, Lord, how vast is your love for us Lord, we thank you for your unconditional, electing love for us. God, we don't understand it. We can't explain it. It is far beyond our minds, but the love of God is something every one of us can personally experience. Father, we thank you for the teachings from your word. And Father, even as you have loved Israel, God, you love us, but God, the desire you have is that we would be a vineyard that would bring forth great fruit, that we would be a child that has been brought off the street, brought into your family, and living a life in gratitude and appreciation to you. Father, as we go forth from this week, keep us mindful of your love, and may it be an impetus for us to love others and be a witness for you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how God has spoken.